in it that we didn't cover, and I just hope that you, in your private study, in your private time, still, still take more out of Psalm 23. But the main thing that I hope you took from Psalm 23 is that the Lord is your shepherd. And if He is your shepherd, you are His sheep. And sheep follow the shepherd. Sheep follow the shepherd. And so, and so we're making it a transition. We're making a transition to Psalms 91, which is also a Psalms of protection, a Psalms of guidance. So if you if you open your Bibles to Psalms 91, although our scripture reading within Psalm 3119, Psalm 3119 is very similar to Psalms 91. While you are looking for Psalm 91, I will just read Psalm 31, 19. And there the scripture reading, and then 20 says, Oh, how great is your goodness which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust you in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. Don't miss that. He will hide us in the secret place. So now in Psalm 91, Psalm 91 begins by saying, we're going to read the whole Psalms. It says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him I will trust. Surely goodness shall deliver you from the snares of the clouds and from the pervious pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and mother. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your Lord. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you, to keep you in all your ways. In their hands shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent, you shall trample underfoot, because he has set his love upon me. Therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Let's go Father in heaven, we are so thankful for these promises that are true and are for us today. I just ask that you be with us as we begin looking at Psalms. I hope that in the next couple of weeks, you have a different look of Psalm 91 and how it can apply to your life, not just daily, but especially as we come to the closing last days of earth history. If you, if you, if you notice, there are some words there in Psalm 91 that, that as the weeks go by, we're going to explore more on how they relate to last day events. Do you notice on how Psalm 91 deals with there may be plagues falling? A thousand may fall on, on, on your side, but none shall come to you. There, there is a lot of application that we can apply to the last day event. But I want to begin. We're going to look at two things. Here in Psalm 91, it begins by saying, He who dwells in the secret 
place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We're going, to, we're going to look at two things. What is the secret place of the Most High? Why is that important? Because the Bible promises, He, whoever dwells there, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. If we are under the shadow of God, God is above us, and we are under His care. There's no other place I'd rather be. Amen, friends? So we're going to look at what is that secret place of the Most High, and what does it mean to dwell there? What does it mean to, to, to dwell there? So I want you to turn your Bible to Ezekiel chapter 7. Ezekiel chapter 7. And this is the whole context of Ezekiel. We're going to look at verses 20. But meanwhile, you're looking for Ezekiel chapter 7. The context of Ezekiel chapter 7 is God's judgment on Israel. God's judgment on Israel because Israel has, has in many times, apostatized, been disobedient. And I invite you to read chapter 7 at home. And so many times, God is, you, you can see it, that God is fed up. And so, so here is God's judgment on Israel and especially on the temple. Here in verse 20, Ezekiel 7, verse 20, the Bible says, As for the beauty of his ornaments, he set it in majesty. But they made from it the images. Why? 
required in his what? Temple. So the house of the Lord is his temple. His protection. Notice verse 5. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon the rock. So here, what is the secret place of the Almighty? The temple of the Lord. David found refuge in the temple of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. And here he says, he will hide me in his secret place of his tabernacle. And the tabernacle was a sanctuary temple. The, the sanctuary temple. And so David's desire is to dwell there all the days of his life. You see, in the Old Testament, in the wilderness, the secret place, there was the sanctuary. A, a portable, a portable version of the temple where God literally dwelt. Where God literally dwelt. God doesn't dwell anymore in a temple today. And we know this because of Matthew 27, verse 51, when Jesus died on the cross there in Matthew 27, the Bible says that the veil in the temple ripped from top to bottom, indicating that the temple services were no longer necessary, the temple of God was no longer in there, because Jesus was here on earth. And so, and so, if, if God did not, did not dwell in an earthly temple, where then does God dwell? In a heavenly temple. And if you join me there in Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, we're going to, we're going, we're going to see that just to see that the secret place of the Almighty is a temple. There in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, and now this is the main point of the things which we are saying. <clears throat> we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord directed and not man. The true sanctuary that who made? God did and not man. So this isn't, this, this isn't a sanctuary or a temple made by man, made by Moses or Solomon or Herod. It's one that God made, and it says there that it is in heaven. If we go to Psalms 102, Psalms 102, we see there another reference of David telling us that God is in his holy temple in heaven. Psalm 102, verse 19. Don't, don't put your place in Hebrews. Psalm 102, verse 19 says, For he, is talking about God, For he looked down from the heights of his sanctuary, from heaven the Lord viewed the earth. So is there a sanctuary in heaven? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So from Hebrews, if, if, if we go back to Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, we even see more specific. There it says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made by with hands, that is, not of this creation. Of the sanctuary in heaven, and verse 4 says, Not with the blood of goats and cattle, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place, once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, in the earthly sanctuary, in the earthly temple, blood was always spilled by goats, by sheep, by bulls, by calves, but here it says, Not with the blood of goats, but with whose blood? With his own blood, Jesus being the Lamb of God, was crucified for you and for me. And here it says, he entered the most holy place. The most holy place. So Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary. And more specific, we know that he is in the most holy place. He is in the most holy place. So if Jesus is in the most holy place, and and the secret place of the Most High is the temple. There is no more earthly temple here, so we so we should then look toward to he the heavenly temple, the heavenly sanctuary. And Jesus is there, and more specific in the.
the most holy place, <coughs> what do we find in the most holy place? For those who are familiar with, with the sanctuary and, and uh, how it's laid out, you had a holy place, you, you had a courtyard, and then you had two compartments which were the holy place and the most holy place. This is basic information for any Seventh-day Adventist. And so, so Jesus is in the most holy place where inside you find the Ark of the Covenant. Is that right? Yeah. Amen. The Ark of the Covenant. May I suggest that in the most holy place you find the distinctive doctrine of Seventh-day Adventist. In the most holy place you find the distinctive doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So in the Ark of the Covenant, what, what is the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments, right? The tablet of stone written with the finger of God. Amen. At Seventh-day Adventist, we believe that the law of God was not nailed to the cross, but it is still valid and true for every Christian to follow. Every Christian to follow. There in Ecclesiastes 4, verse 13, it says, Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. Fear God and keep His commandments. John 15, verse 10, Jesus said, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And even Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. So the commandments are still, are still valid today. If it wasn't for the commandments, who wouldn't know what sin is? And that's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. By the law, I know that, that I shouldn't have any other God, but just have God as my only true God. By the law, I, I know that I shouldn't commit adultery, not just physically, but even mentally. I shouldn't covet uh, what other people have. I shouldn't steal. By the law of God, I know what sin is. What sin is. But we are not saved by the law, friends. We are saved by Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's why, that's why also in the law, we have the fourth commandment that tells us, remember the seventh day to keep it holy. Six days you shall work and do all that work, but the seventh day is of the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And the Sabbath, as Jesus says, was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And if you join me in Isaiah chapter 66, Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 66, the Sabbath has been kept from creation. All through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, even New Testament believers, after the resurrection of Christ, the Sabbath has, has been kept and has been kept throughout history. And is the Sabbath still being kept today? Amen. We're here. There in Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 and 23, it will be kept forever. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, said the Lord. So shall your descendants and your name and your name remain, and it shall come to pass that from one one new moon to another, from one month to another, and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. All flesh shall come and worship before me, says the Lord. Sorry. So in the Ark of the Covenant, we find the law of God, which we believe that is still bad. God still wants His children to be commandment keepers. And in those commandments we have the Sabbath. A distinctive doctrine of Seventh-day Adventist, which we believe is, is, is very important, especially uh, as the last days come closer. But the law of God does not save us. It tells us that I am a sinner, and I am in need of a Savior. You see, when I look at the law, I see how dirty I am. I see the filth that I am, the, the things that I covet, the things that are part in my mind. Sometimes I may put other things in front of God. And so, so I can't go to the law to find forgiveness. No, I go to Jesus. That's why in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, here Paul tells us, Therefore the law was, a, was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law brings us to Christ. Again, one of our distinct doctrines is that not the law saves us, but Jesus Christ saves us. We obey the law because we love Jesus. That's why he says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. If you love me. And so because we love him, and the law brings us closer to him, Jesus
known as the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. If we turn to James chapter 2, you see, the law is so important because by the law, we are judged. That's why we can't get rid of the law. Because by the law, we know that we are sinners. And by the law, we are also judged. James chapter 2. James chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. And the message of judgment is also a distinctive message of the Seventh day Adventist Church. Dear James chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who is said, do not commit adultery, and also do not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So, speak and so do all those who will be judged by the law of liberty. So here we see that we're going to be judged by the law. By the law of God. Now, we're going to be judged by the law of God, and we know that there is a judgment coming. That is what the Bible does teach in one of our distinctive doctrines, especially of the work of Jesus in the most holy place. Judgment. What does Jesus, does Jesus judge before he comes or after he comes? But turn with me to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. So we see that, that the, the, the message of judgment is in the most holy place, which is our distinctive message. And we're going to even see now that even the message of the state of the dead, what happens when you die, is even in the most holy place. Okay? Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31. Here, Luke says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now command all men everywhere to repent. I want to read that verse first because, friends, God cannot demand us to do something that we are not aware of. Of times of ignorance that we don't know, God overlooks. That is a God of love and mercy. Amen. But when we know better, then God expects us to do something. Verse 31 says, Because He has appointed a day which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So we know for sure that there is a judgment coming. And according here to Acts, the, the judgment was future. So we can say that the judgment was coming after 3180, after, 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 after the resurrection. After the resurrection. Because it says, He will judge the world in righteousness. He has appointed a day. So it's after Jesus. Jesus' is resurrection. But then Romans 14, verse 10, tells us that Jesus is going to judge. And this is all to make the case that judgment will be before he comes. Before he comes. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. It says, Why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt? For your brother, for we shall all stand before the judgment seat of who? Of Christ. We all stand before the judgment seat of who? And Revelation 22, Revelation 22 tells us that when he comes, verse 12, 22, verse 12, Revelation 22, verse 12, when he comes, judgment will already have happened. It says, and behold, I am coming quickly, to the word of Christ, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. So when he comes, he is going to give them the reward. Now, does the judge give the reward before he judges or after he has already judged? After. After. After the judge has viewed the evidence and listened to all the, the pros and cons, and then he made judgment. Then, if the reward is freedom, that's your reward. If your reward is time in jail, that's your reward. But if the reward comes after the judge has, has done his work. So there we can see that judgment is before he comes. So if judgment is before he comes, this is important. 
because they haven't been judged yet. Is it making sense? No one can sneak into heaven before he comes because he's still doing the work of judging. And until he comes, he gives everyone their reward, as we saw there in Revelation. And the reward will be everlasting life or, or everlasting death. So therefore the dead don't go to heaven or don't go to hell. According to 1 Thessalonians, if you, if you turn with me there, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14. A very well-known text. It says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. You can see already on, on, on what Jesus refers to those who have died. Those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Don't miss that. It's not by, by what I say. It's by what God says. It's by the word of the Lord. Even Paul says. It's not by my word, but by the word of the Lord. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means perceive those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So obviously the dead in Christ are not anywhere near heaven or hell. So they are sleeping in the arms of Christ. They are, there, they are in a sleep mode waiting for what? For the trumpet of God, for the archangel, for the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then, notice verse 17, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up and the word there is together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So then, those who are dead in Christ, that means you have died, believing, putting your faith in Jesus, and you have died before He comes. When He comes, then, Bible says, not before, but then, you will raise up first, and with those who remain alive together, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. No one's going to meet the Lord before us, or before those who are um, alive when He comes. Together we'll meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen. So in the most holy place, we find our distinctive doctrine there. We find the law of God, which is still valid. We find the Sabbath, which is still valid. We find salvation only through Jesus Christ. We find judgment. We find the state of the dead. Because if judgment hasn't happened, then no one can go to heaven. The state of the dead, we find a message there. And there are other doctrines we find in the sanctuary, in the most holy place that I'm not covering right now. We find the health message. Because in the Ark of the Covenant, there was a bowl of manna. We find the spirit of prophecy in the in the heart in the most holy place. Because when judgment began, according to Daniel 8 and Daniel 9, which was 1844, God gave the spirit of prophecy in 1844. So what does it mean to dwell in the secret place of the most high? In the secret place of the most high is a temple. And there's no earthly temple here now that we're looking at. But it points us to the heavenly temple. And we look at Jesus is in the most holy place. And we see our distinctive doctrines there. What does it mean then to dwell in the most, to dwell in the secret place of the most high? According to the American, American Heritage Dictionary, the word dwell means to live in. To live in, to reside in, not, not to live in. But to live in, in the condition of always being there. When, when the Bible talks about dwelling, it talks about being present somewhere. When, when the Bible says that Abraham dwelt in Egypt, he didn't visit, he literally lived in Egypt there for, for a time. When the Bible says there in Exodus 25 verse 8 where God says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God literally was
was there, not symbolically. He literally was there in the Hebrew sanctuary. Sometimes this is known as the Shekinah glory that hovered over the Ark of the Covenant. And nobody could go in because God's presence was literally there. To dwell means to, to be there. And if you turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, here Peter gives us uh, an, an example. Just, just how a husband and a wife, they dwell together, don't they? They live together. They are always in the presence of each other. When you are married, you dwell with your spouse. That's why the Bible says that, you know, you should leave father and mother. Why? Because now you're going to dwell, to live, to live with your husband or to live with your wife. There in 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, most of us men, we like chapter uh, uh, verse 1. Wives, likewise, submit to your husband. And although some may call it no chauvinist friend, it's a biblical message. Why should submit to their husbands? But verse 7 is what we forget as men. Verse 7 says, Husbands, likewise, like what? Likewise, what does that mean? Like what? Reading a little bit of the context, like the wives submit to the husbands, husbands, likewise. So we don't, we, don't get a, we don't get away. God's telling us, husbands, you, likewise, like you want the wives to be to you, you be to your wives also. Husbands, likewise, and then it says, dwell. Dwell with them. With what? Understanding. Amen. Those, those men who are married know that we need understanding to dwell with our wives. Amen. Amen. It's not easy, but God has asked us to have understanding. Be patient. God purposely made us different. <coughs> Dwell with them with understanding. And then it says, giving honor to the wife. Giving honor to the wife. So as we dwell, as, as Peter here is, is, is using the word dwell, that a spouse, they are constantly together. And here, he's giving the husbands, you know, a a little more tug that we need to be more understanding with the wives. We need to honor them. Honor them. That's a whole message in itself. If we are honoring our wives. So here, Peter is telling us as an example of dwelling is to be together, to live together, to reside together. Now, if in the most holy place our distinctive doctrines are there, are we dwelling there? As Seventh-day Adventists, do we dwell in, in present truth? Do we dwell in present truth? Do we dwell in the distinctive doctrines of the church? Do we believe that we are living in judgment time right now? Amen. And strive to live a holy life. That's the message of judgment. It's not just, oh, okay, we're in judgment. It's that we begin to ask God to purify and refine our heart and to help us live a holy life. And not that we just come every Sabbath and just punch the clock. But that we strive to live every day a holy life because we are living in judgment and power. In judgment and time. If you have ever been in front of a judge, which I have, you are nervous. And you put on the best smile, the nicest clothes, right? Why? Because you're in judgment. Even though you may be innocent and you may not have been speeding, you're still in front of the judge. You're still in front of the judge. And so as we are living in judgment time right now, how are we living? Do we believe and still dwell in our distinctive darkness? We believe that the Sabbath, that the law of God is so important, that the Sabbath is still valid, and live to honor it. Amen. Do we dwell in the secret place of the Most High? Do we dwell in the distinctive doctrines of our church? The biblical message, the biblical messages of our church <coughs> are hardly He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. The secret place of the and we follow Jesus wherever he 
Israel is he is in the most holy place. And I want to dwell with him. And in the most holy place we find our distinctive doctrines there. Are we dwelling in our doctrines? Amen. And I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, not only to hold up our doctrines, but to live them every day. To live them every day. You see, there was a time, there was a time where, you, where people could recognize the Seventh-day Adventists. There was a time where people were stuck, where Seventh-day Adventists stuck out. But slowly and surely they have been blending in with the world. Now you can't even tell if there's a Seventh-day Adventist or not. But praise the Lord, there is still a remnant group. There is still a remnant group that dwells in the Most High. That dwells in the presence of God. That dwells in the distinctive doctrines and holds up this present truth. Why do we to dwell in the present truth? Because that's where Jesus presently is. He is in the most holy place. He is presently there, so we need to hold up this present truth every day of our lives as well. And I just appeal to you, brothers and sisters, that we dwell there not just here on Sabbath, not just today. The Bible doesn't say there in Psalm 91, He who visits the secret place of the Most High, but he who dwells Dwells, living there every day. Just how we dwell with our spouse, just how we dwell in the city that we live in, we dwell in our home. Does our doctrine, do we believe, do, do what we believe at 7 p.m. and do we dwell in that? Ask yourself those questions. And I just want to appeal for the visitors and for our members. Maybe this has been something new. I appeal to you to turn to Colossians chapter 3. This is our closing text. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. You see, sometimes I hear that we need to preach Jesus and not our doctrine. Our distinctive doctrines are separate from Jesus. Friends, I beg to differ. Jesus is all over our doctrines. If you think that they're different, you need to get to know Jesus. Here in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart, the Lord. Let the word of Christ dwell. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and teaching. The doctrines of the Seventh-day Adventist Church are filled with the grace and love. Every single one. Every single one. If you think they are different, I appeal to you to study them again and get to know Jesus through the spirit of prophecy. Get to know Jesus through the state of the dead. Get to know Jesus through the judgment message. Get to know Jesus through the Sabbath. Get to know Jesus through every single doctrine that we have. Then in verse 17 says, And whatever you do in words or deeds, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father through Him. The church... I just appeal to you, as Seventh Day Adventists, we have a truth that is more valuable than more. Amen. And the world, the world needs to know the true character of God. Amen. The true character of God. Not a God that has people suffering in hell forever. I wouldn't want to show that kind of God. No, thank you. But a God that shows mercy and love. Praise the Lord that our distinctive doctrines show that. And I just appeal to you that if, if, if these doctrines are new to you, to study them. And as the verse there says, Colossians, let the 